Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mountain Travel Symposium's next webinar in our Recovery Road series. I'm your host, Kat Shaw, the Director of Marketing and Content for Mountain Travel Symposium, and I'm really glad to have everyone here with me today. So for those of you who haven't joined us before, I just want to go over a couple of the webinar features. We have a Q&A, you'll, you'll see, um, you could submit Q&A to all of the panelists. Um, I ask that you wait and, and submit Q&A at the end of the webinar when we have our specific uh, Q&A session. There's also a chat box. Please try and submit your questions via the Q&A and not the chat box. And then we also have a survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar. Uh, we encourage you to take that and give us your feedback on today's content and speakers, as well as uh, submit suggestions for future webinars. It's very helpful to get your feedback so that we can plan for future webinars. And so today we are super excited to uh, bring three panelists up here and uh, have a little bit of a conversation about the mountain resorts and the, from the perspective of mountain resorts. Uh, if you had joined us two weeks ago, we talked with DMOs and we kind of got the recovery perspective from uh, DMOs. And so today we are joined by Katie Ertel, the Senior VP of Mountain Operations for Aspen Ski and Company, Rebecca Hornung, the Indoor Operations Manager for Whitewater Ski Resort, and Tyler Lamott, the Chief Brand Officer for Jackson Hole Mountain Resort. So I will be doing one-on-one -on -one interviews with each of our panelists and we'll hear a little bit about what's happening at their resort. And then at the end of the webinar, everyone will come back on screen and we will do a little bit of a Q&A. So with that, I would like to ask Katie to join me uh, on stage and uh, we will get started. So hi, Katie, welcome. Uh, and thank you so much for, for joining us and being here to talk to the MTS audience. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. And so can you give us a little bit of a, a snapshot of what things look like at uh, the various Aspen Ski and Company resorts? Yeah, happy to. So we have, uh, as you know, four resorts uh, for winter operations. And in the summer, we have two resorts that have summer activities. So currently, we have been able to open on Aspen Mountain for sightseeing, and we have a few activities at the top that are self-guided. Uh, our customers can make a choice of whether or not they want to get on a little obstacle course or climb into the spirit nest. Um, we've really played disc golf, things like that. Um, and then over at Snowmass, we've got quite a few activities available. So we have both a gondola and a chairlift running right now with activities around challenge courses, coasters, and uh, our biggest uh, popular event right now is the Snowmass Bike Park. Great. So is, is what's popular right now different from what you're typically seeing in the summer? Or can you tell me a little bit about how things have, have changed based on, you know, the corona situation? Sure. Sure. So uh, just to, to back up a little bit, it was really an interesting process to go through the planning portion of how are we going to open. And I think we had envisioned a lot of things that we could do right based on restriction from the county and state governments. Um, as far as cleaning and disinfecting and all of those pieces, what we didn't anticipate was how popular some of our activities were going to be. Um, and looking back now, being outside is a wonderful new adventure for all of us. And it's as stated by the CDC and many other science, uh, scientific articles, um, it's a good place to be. So biking has gone off the charts. We have a mountain, a downhill mountain bike park um, that serves everything from beginner to expert and is lift served. So we've really seen that activity boost. And uh, with our local community, as well as the drive market that's coming up to actually use the park, um, childcare has been uh, in large demand and we run a summer camp. So we've seen our camp numbers go through the roof. We have had to make some shifts in our product offerings and really take a look at um, how we can offer private adventures for families and for um, opportunities for smaller groups to get together outside. 
Uh, and that camp does a lot of on mountain activities as well. And interestingly enough, we have a challenge course open and that when you think about that in your planning process, you think all of the pieces and parts that have to be cleaned uh, and, and, and looked after, um, but it's proven to be quite successful and having the right disinfectant and cleaning opportunities for the guests to make choices has allowed that activity to be very popular. So um, yeah, we've seen that. And then again, just, and you'll hear it so many times today, but people being able to do things outside has really uh, been a savior for this whole process. So Katie, you mentioned, you know, the, the deep cleaning and all of that, and then it actually seems like it's a more involved staffing uh, process and requirement. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of mountains have had to deal with layoffs or reduced staff because of, of reduced revenue. How have you managed to work through and, and still provide a certain level of care or even a, a larger level of care for um, your uh, travelers with potentially, re you know, reduced staff? So that's a great question. What we've really tried to figure out in the past, so guess some levels of guest service have changed. For example, in the past, we would load mountain bikes into the gondola at Snowmass for the guest. And we've uh, pulled all of the bike racks out of our gondola cars and we've created a situation where by the guest can take care of a lot of their own equipment. We'll, we're there to coach them and help them if they need it. Um, but what that's done is freed up some of our lift operations to work on the disinfection side. So using electrostatic sprayers, Lysol, wiping things down. Um, so we've really had to look at where we can put personal responsibility on the guest without impacting them greatly. We've changed our gates. We got a, a, we're checking out some new gates by access to see how mountain bikes can get through them more easily. Um, so, and, and that's just one example. At camp, we've really created um, some opportunities for the guests to have a touchless check-in and enrollment process. They have to make reservations now. So we are able to staff appropriately and allow for smaller groups so we can keep, you know, kids socially distanced and in masks uh, as, as is required. Um, so that's how we've been able to shift staff around is finding ways that where we used to do it for them, they do it for themselves, and we then are able to reallocate staff where needed. Great, and that is a great cat because because this COVID um, situation has caused has created a need to um, to disinfect for for safety and for optics as well. Right, we need to be doing it while the guest is walking. Yep, absolutely. So you mentioned uh, the drive market, and I'm curious to hear how um, you know how your the traveler profile has changed and what you're you're seeing who is visiting you this summer. Yeah, and actually, I think with Aspen Snowmask, we have tended to have more of a drive market in summer than uh, a fly market, and 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 a lot of folks will take the time to drive up here, spend two weeks with us and then work their way through, or they'll do a short trip through. So um, we have seen a strong drive market, a strong local market. And what we're actually starting to see in the last two months is that people are exiting urban areas and staying with us for three, four, five months to a year. So we're starting to see folks moving into their second homes um, and staying for this, what's this upcoming school year, we've started to see folks making rentals for three or four months because they can work from home, quote home, in, in Aspen and Basalt. Um, so we've started to see a, a guest that we would only see for a week at a time in summer show up and become more of a local resident, if you will. Uh, that, that Sorry to, to, add, to continue on that. I guess the big question for us is going to be what winter looks like, right? With, with our uh, situation changing with international, um, Australia's got some rules and regulations. We have airlines that are canceling flights for, you know, a year at a time. Um, we've got situations where Europe won't allow us over there. So will Europe be willing to come to us? And so we're very curious to see what changes might occur over the winter season and we're preparing for some weekend spikes um, versus those longer stays uh, because we do feel that there could be a stronger drive market for this winter. 
So you totally took the follow-up question right, <laughs> right out of my mouth. So um, I'm glad. Sorry. <laughs> oh, glad you would address that for our audience because I, I know that there's a lot of interest of uh, you know what what the winter looks like, and um, so because because you're seeing this change in the summer, are you doing anything to shift or your you know the the larger teams? I know you're on the operations side. Doing anything to shift the messaging or um, the marketing that's that's being put out there to um, you know to attract locals. Yeah. So that, in fact, we, we just started the conversation on that yesterday. We've got a gentleman in our, on our staff that works with community engagement and communication. And the question was, how do we get to these people that are now here with us uh, and are planning on staying, uh, even if it's just for a year? Um, so the marketing campaign, everything's changed, right? We've, we're looking at different images with social distancing. We're looking at how do we communicate to our guests about our safety measures and our protocols uh, while encouraging new adventures outside. Um, so for, from marketing's perspective, that has happened. As far as reaching out to our community, our CEO and, uh, and our communications team are really working hard to make sure that every four to five weeks, there's a communication that goes out informing folks of, of opportunities as well as protocols that, that we have to stick by um, in, in effort to keep everything safe and open. So um, I think we're, we're gonna, it, it's, 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 it's a good question and we're continuing to work through that conversation as we figure out how to communicate better out to those folks. But we wanna encourage them to come in and be a part of our community and uh, take opportunity with all of the different products we have that can get them on mountain both summer and winter. Great. And you had mentioned earlier, um, you know, with the reopening, working with local officials and, and the government. Um, and mm -hmm. is that a different process for allowing, um, you know, travelers to come and ski in the winter? Is it, is it a different process that you have to go through? Or um, is, is a lot of what you've done for the summer, you know, and transfer over to uh, winter? That is a great question. We do, uh, with, with Picking County, where our resorts are, are housed in that county, we've been working very closely with providing safety plans to, and business plans to the, the county officials, and they walk th through all of those and make sure we're sticking to plan. If anything needs to be adapted or changed, we can have that conversation with them and readjust the plan. What we're finding for, uh, for winter is that we have so many different Summer is such a small operation for us. It's, it's at two mountains, it's you know very few portals of entry. In winter, everything opens up and we've got parking and transportation and airlines and all of these um, food and beverage operations and rental retail that are going to see a much higher volume than they are right now. And so uh, we're walking through an exercise to figure out how we can safely and appropriately operate those venues at lower capacity um, with because of social distancing. And then we'd like to present that to the county um, and state that we can do this safely. So we're, it's, we literally started a week and a half ago looking at winter and all of those opportunities um, for how we can get people on mountain. Once they're on the lifts, we feel like no problem, but boy, the whole lot to lift piece is the one we're walking through right now. So a little bit, I think a little bit more intense than we've seen for summer, for sure. Um, you no, know, it definitely, it definitely is a different process. So, um, uh, glad, you know, glad you got that, that plan in place. Um, yeah. So and I think, sorry, I think the goals are just to protect the safety of the guest of the employee. Um, and then provide an experience that's consistent with our brand, if, if that's doable, and then uh, demonstrate to the regulators that we can manage the situation and they have full trust in us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really essential to have that, have that positive relationship there. Um, so uh, I've got one more question for you. And as we're looking towards the winter with, uh, you know, season pass sales, have, have you seen anything with trends there that are are happening um, that are different from usual or different from what you expected at this point in time? Yeah, we, we actually have not seen a difference in, in trend of purchasing. So people are not reluctant to buy 
But what we've done is make a shift on our end. So we, um, last spring, we set uh, the wheels in motion to make a, a purchase of, of a pass possible by putting down a, a deposit and then full payment by September 1st. So they could think about if they were going to be willing to commit to that process and they had held their pass at the price that they wanted. Um, and then what we've done is after we collect uh, anything in September, we've then offered full refund capabilities until uh, through November 20th. So if a guest purchases the pass in full and then we see that the snow isn't good or they have something happen with their family or they're moving, whatever the case, they can get a full refund. So we've created a process that's low risk so that we can uh, pull them in with um, ease of access and, and ease of mind. I think that that's really smart, um, uh, you know, from the consumer perspective, nobody wants to be super locked into anything mm -hmm. <laughs> at this point in time. I think that's, I think that's the new, the new way of the world right now. Yeah. We've given sure. them that flexibility there with the way you've structured that. So. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you, Katie. Our, our time is up, uh, but we will see you back for our Q and A. So I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Yes. I'll um, be right here. And with that, I'm going to ask Rebecca Hornung from Whitewater Ski Resort to, to join us. Hi, Rebecca. Hello. So um, why don't you start off and give our audience a, a bit of an idea of what's happening at Whitewater right now. I know it's, it's a little bit different than what a lot of other resorts are experiencing. Um, absolutely. So Whitewater Ski Resort, for those are, who are unfamiliar, is located in British Columbia um, interior. On a map, we're basically halfway between Calgary and Vancouver, and we're located about 45 minutes north of the Washington border. Um, Nelson's a city of about 10,000 people. Um, so we have a really great community, but we are located at uh, 22 kilometers. I wouldn't be able to convert that in miles, but uh, basically a 30 minute, 30 minute drive from the, the town um, up into the mountains. So that's just kind of a, a feel of the resort itself. Um, we actually are quite lucky at this time not to have summer operations. Uh, so we've actually already been um, deep into the planning for winter. Um, yeah, we, like everyone else, had the early closure on March 15th. Um, and yeah, I can speak a little bit more to where we are currently, Kat, if you'd like. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, you know, just because you don't have summer operations doesn't mean you've been twiddling your thumbs all of this time. So um, a little uh, bit. A little bit. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I think you're in a unique position that you don't have necessarily the distraction of summer to focus on um, plans for for winter. So yeah, tell us a little bit about what what some of those plans entail. Absolutely. So. When uh, we kind of went through that early closure, um, we kind of jumped straight into strategic planning. Um, first thing we did was kind of, uh, well, we used this guideline that a resonance consultancy put forth. It's a recovery guideline, basically pre-recovery, um, early recovery and late recovery. So uh, we started with our pre-recovery, breaking it into kind of three different realms, operations, marketing and partnerships. Um, so we basically said, what can we do for spring cleaning? What can we do to build a foundation so that when recovery begins that we're ahead of the game um, and ready to basically press play instead of trying to scramble and catch up and having that opportunity to do so. Um, so we kind of did that in the spring marketing. Um, we took our mission statement and basically um, how to keep our brand awareness through this, but also be prepared um, with a new marketing theme based on what the new environment looks like um, and then partnerships just really keeping a lead in the community um, keeping strong communications with our local DMO our destination marketing organization as well as the the city um, and our, our small businesses in the community because uh, when we shut down it's a big threat for them um, in terms of their sustainability and that's a big part of what our resort is is the community so um, yeah basically making sure that we had a strong communication with them um, so right now we're actually moved into the early recovery. Speaking of twiddling my thumbs, we all kind of took a bit of time off because in May, when you're talking about December, it was a bit a little bit too soon. Um, so we've been taking a lot of time learning um, what other resorts are going through in terms of their summer operations, as well as in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. 
Um, we've definitely been uh, learning a lot, so I really appreciate everyone sharing. Uh, but yeah, so right now early recovery, so we've been basically preparing like crisis outbreak plans. Um, if there's a risk level change in terms of the amount of COVID cases in our community, how does that shift our operations? Um, getting our feedback from guests and staff, making sure that we're starting those channels of communication moving. Um, so yeah, we've been definitely attending a lot of webinars with our team. We have a lot of working committees. Um, we have a really strong organization, Canada West Ski Area Association, um, that represent all the ski resorts in Western Canada. And they've been having a lot of working groups. Um, for example, we just had one yesterday with school groups and how do we try and get schools out in the mountains this winter. Um, so sharing information um, and learning from each other what we're doing, what ideas we can do to get through this together. So since you've had a lot of time to do a lot of learning and listening and, and looking and, and you mentioned the Southern Hemisphere, what are some of the key things that you've learned as well as the key things that you're going to or looking into implementing uh, for Whitewater in, in the winter? Um, good question. So definitely, I think, obviously, kind of even what Katie discussed, basically modifying your operations in terms of keeping safety forefront. We're definitely making sure that we have all those steps in place for sanitization, social distancing. Um, yeah, I think a, a lot of it is still unknown. It is still quite early, even as Katie said, they just started thinking winter this last week and a half. Um, so I think a lot of will shift, but I think that's where communication will be really forefront in terms of communicating to our staff, getting their feedback and then communicating to our guests as well. Um, it's really interesting to see what is happening in the summer resorts um, uh, locally and south of the border. I mean, uh, we kind of talked about this before we got became live, but outdoor spaces, less faces is definitely the theme and um, a lot of outdoor activities that are individual are thriving. So um, it seems like that, and hopefully I'll carry through the winter. So I'm um, planning for that and making sure that we are adaptable and ready to pivot. It's the number one word for COVID times. So uh, you talked about brand purpose, and I, I would I would love to hear some specific examples um, uh, about and brand, and brand awareness for you know those who are not. Um, because you, you don't have, are currently welcoming travelers to your resort. What are some of the things that you've been doing to um, keep, keep the resort top of mind to, um, to your, your travelers? Well, we definitely work really strongly with our local DMO um, just because they are currently active um, in the market. Um, so we basically are just communicating right now that our plans are to open for the winter. It will look different, but it will still be the same great experience that we will be offering um, in terms of our brand. Um, definitely just getting feedback again from our sending out surveys from our guests to say and uh, to ask, I guess, what, what their expectations are, because um, that's going to be pretty, pretty important piece moving forward. Um, and then also kind of working with our, our city just so that we are understanding what our community needs are too, because it's, it's a bit of a, a weird dynamic where um, what is the comfort level of our community inviting people in. Mm -hmm. So, so on, on that subject, um, and you mentioned being very close to the uh, U.S. border, is your marketing going to change based on um, whether you're able to or anticipating that you're not going to be able to welcome U.S. travelers? Yeah, I would say yes and no. Um, we definitely do have a strong contingent that comes from the United States. Um, a shout out to our sister resort, Spitzer. We've worked uh, strongly with them for many years and done a lot of initiatives. Um, so we still keep those partnerships um, strong and communicating so that if things do change, we're ready to pivot. Um, but yeah, I think definitely we're focusing more, of course, on a regional Canada market. So Alberta and BC, which we do still see strong visitation from them previously. So um, it'll be interesting to see if there will be a shift um, from people that used to drive south that are now going to stay and visit in Canada. So it's it is really hard to gauge what the visitation will be coming this winter, but you just basically have to be prepared for all cases. And so, so with that, I know your, your season pass sales uh, are not 
you know, you haven't, haven't gone on sale yet, but um, how do you anticipate prioritizing the season pass holder versus uh, some, you know, somebody who may just come once or twice in this certain situation where limited capacity, you know, limited availability for um, people on chairlifts and gondolas and whatnot? Yeah, I think similar to what Katie said, um, I think getting them out on the mountain, once that piece is done, um, we have a lot of fresh air mountain spaces for them. It is, it is that base area indoor that's gonna be challenging. So um, we're definitely keeping our pass holders full forefront. They, being a community, a strong community resort, they are kind of our, our core. 40% um, of Nelson, residents actually hold a season's pass. So um, we're definitely a strong skiing community. Um, so definitely when we're making our decisions, we're keeping that in mind, but also wanting to make sure other people feel as welcomed as much as we can do so. Um, yeah, I think that kind of focusing on that base area experience, how do we expand our capacity there? How do we have more outdoor spaces and services um, versus what we have right now, just to kind of make sure that people, some people are not going to want to come into the day lodge, for example, it's a smaller day lodge than you'd experience at Jackson Hole or at um, Aspen Snowmass. So how do we have other spaces for them so that they can get out skiing, but not necessarily um, need to visit our, our day lodge services. So what are you looking to, are you looking to create new spaces that didn't exist before out, outdoors or what does that look like or that planning look like? Yeah, exactly. So how do we have more like our um, outdoor structures and what does that look like to manage snow load and such so that even if it ne doesn't necessarily have the services that the day lodge offers, um, maybe it's just a warm space. Um, how do we service them like again, more that touch free experience. How do you get them onto the lift um, with minimal contact and, and providing still that same experience that you did before. Yeah, I think that uh, that no touch is is very important, and um, we've I've heard of a lot of technology being implemented. Is that anything that you guys are looking at in order to, um, you know, having doors that open on sensors or or, or what have you? Um, that's a really good question. Whitewater is a bit old school, um, so we're actually looking at people. <laughs> so we're talking about expanding our mountain house program so that we have base area ambassadors because um, the one thing that I feel is causing a co lot of anxiety um, with this pandemic is people aren't sure how to be and how to act. Um, so we're really trying to focus on making that easy for them. So uh, kind of going back to expectations, how do we give them clear expectations on what they can expect from us, but also what we expect from them. Um, and then back to that mountain host program, expanding that so that we have those base area ambassadors to help answer those questions, direct people to where they go with a more personal feel um, because we all know not everyone reads a sign. Um, so we're really focusing on how do we reduce that anxiety but still provide that kind of personal experience Whitewater is known for. Um, we don't have any Wi-Fi or cell service at the ski resort. So um, that really does limit us in terms of our technology options. Um, but again, it's like, what is our brand and how do we navigate COVID with that, that brand that we're known for? I think that's, that's really important. And you, both you and Katie have mentioned that of, you know, creating this new environment related to safety and health that still resonates with your brand. And so I love the fact that, you know, you're using people and employing, uh, employing people to get the job done versus, uh, technology that's that's you know it, it's uh you mentioned it being a little old school but i i think it's innovative as well uh yeah you're more likely to see a human open, opening the door for you than a technological sliding door yeah <laughs> great well thank you so much we uh, um are at time but um we'll have you back with us for q a so thanks okay, so thank much you. For lots of good insight all right, and uh, next up is Tyler from Jackson Hole Mountain Resort. Hi, Tyler, welcome. Hi, Kat, how are you? Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. And uh, again, same as the other, start off by letting us know what, what it looks like currently for you guys at Jackson and, and how open you are and what's, what's going on there. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, well, summer is in full swing here at Jackson Hole Mountain Resort. Uh, we've been open since Saturday, May 30th. So we've been tracking now through what we see as a pretty busy summer, uh, busier than we actually anticipated. And that's not just only at Jackson Hole Mountain Resort, that's also in the town of Jackson. You know, as we know that we are situated near Grand Teton National Park, which we actually border on the property, as well as, of course, Yellowstone is a huge driver. And just visitation in the summer in Jackson is always significant uh, and more so than winter. And we're seeing, you know, not exactly the same as what it would be in a typical summer, but it's definitely beyond, I think, everyone's expectations. So uh, in some aspects, I think that's caught a little bit everyone off guard because we didn't really know what to anticipate going into summer planning and operations. Uh, but we've been able to quickly ramp up and scale and be able to really service this guest that has a strong, strong desire to escape their urban environment and reconnect with nature. Uh, the beauty of, of Wyoming is, you know, we have a lot of open space here. So we have six people per square mile in our state. So there's obviously a lot of open space for people to be able to recreate. We're seeing that demand just being exceptionally high, just given our surroundings and all the activities that we have. Uh, health and safety is priority one. Um, we do have uh, town and county mask ordinance in place. Uh, we had been adhering and developing our mask ordinance even in advance of that. Uh, social distancing messaging, hygiene, all of our mountain safety protocols. Um, it's been really extensive and a pretty incredible learning just in terms of how we're, we're messaging and how we're running the operation and trying to do it safely. Um, just from the activity side, you know, we are seeing, and I think these macro trends that are happening elsewhere as well, our bike park is absolutely on fire. And I think that tracks with what you're seeing with bike sales and also bike rentals, whether that be the downhill bike park or even just the pathways of people wanting to ride, you know, road bikes back and forth into the park. It's just that, you know, the trails are, are definitely being used. They're full, the pathways are full. Um, and that's been really exciting. And our bike park is actually outpacing performance of, of last year. So, uh, and that's not only the thing that's working really well, and we're seeing hiking and sightseeing and retail and food and beverage are all doing quite well for us. Um, so there's a lot of positive signs and tons of learnings that we're being able to garner every single day. So it's been, uh, it's been interesting. It's been fun and uh, exceeding our expectations right now. Good. Well, it's great to hear uh, positive, positive news and the, the lots, lots of interest that you guys have there. So what are some of the things that you are learning and how is what you're learning right now going to inform what you do uh, in the winter? Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, things in terms of, um, you know, the health and safety is, is probably the biggest thing that we're, we're learning. One is, you know, I'd say the adherence to the protocols that are in place. Uh, it's fluid, it's, it's constantly changing. And so we need to constantly adapt as well. Um, and that's looking at, you know, how we're maintaining social distancing, how we're using signage within the resort. Obviously, you know, the, the personal touch and guest service is really critical, but also having the right information to try to minimize as much confusion as possible. And that would be whether in lift lines, whether entering buildings, uh, whether we're communicating out through our resort app, the JH Insider app that we have, uh, looking at technology in different ways for messaging, like uh, in-resort text messaging platform, um, other technologies that we're looking at, like iBeacon technology, where we can do Bluetooth direct communication with the guests to inform them um, if there is, you know, whether it be a lift wait time or whether it would be a loading protocol, um, in addition to being able, again, to support our staff, uh, just we're realizing that communication and over communication is just so important. And that's not only just internally, but that's also within our community here at Teton Village, as well as our key stakeholders that we have in the community of the town of Jackson. So that part is, uh, is essential. So really trying to engage the guests and make them feel like there's you know, no confusion. They understand how to recreate safely and how to really experience the mountain in its best possible way, uh, given the new reality that we sit in. And so are you finding, you know, Rebecca had, had mentioned not everybody reads all the signs um, and I, I totally walked in somewhere where it, you know, said, scan, scan this QR code before you enter and we'll let you in. Um, and, and so are you finding that it's working? Are you finding that people are adhering or people are adhering to the, the mask requirement and all of the protocols that you've put in place? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a hybrid approach for sure in terms of the personal touch and um, signage and messaging. I mean, obviously where there is direct contact with uh, one of our employees, you know, we have plexiglass screens up that they're dividing uh, the guest. The guest gets it pretty quickly and understands that we take this very seriously. And by requiring masks, you know, literally you, as you're going into each one of our, our buildings or even through our lift lines where it says masks are required, uh, it's pretty front and center that people understand that they need to have that. And especially no one wants to get turned away, um, you know, or have to stop in a line and hold up the line because they're trying to get their mask on. So they're learning. It's just, it's just new behaviors. And I think we, you know, are trying to be patient with the guests as we all try to adapt. But our ultimate goal is keeping them safe and keeping our employees safe. Mm -hmm. um, and so obviously as, you know, chief, brand officer and Rebecca and Katie both touched on brand. What are the, the signature brand things uh, that you've that you've kept that have been most important to keep uh, with Jackson through this entire process? Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the key goals for us is trying to meet the guest where they are, right? And I think that uh, as we went into this from a closure standpoint in March and then through this gap into opening, we kept our marketing and messaging constant and not in a marketing and messaging and promotion, but also trying to create aspiration. And so when we were in that kind of middle ground from closure to reopening, a lot of it was digestible content. It was a lot of uh, really talking about this place as a destination and trying to drive a sense of calm, but also I'd say continuity. So people knew that we were always still there. We're always still messaging. We're a part of this together as we're going through this level of uncertainty, but trying to be a, a bit of a beacon of, of hope and inspiration. And so as we transitioned through that period, and then we went into our summer campaign, uh, the campaign that we're running now is called Return to the Wild. And so we talk about the essence of this big mountain and our wild open spaces that we have surrounding us. Uh, we really wanted to focus in on that. So go from aspiration and then ultimately to intent as people were starting to, I'd say, come out of their homes, starting to think about how they can recreate safely and really showcasing and messaging to them that this is a safe place to do it. I love that, return to the wild. That's very, very clever. Um, so as far as who you're reaching out to and who you're seeing visit, what sort of changes have, um, have, have happened there with who's visiting? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, what we're finding is, is last minute travelers. Uh, definitely that continues to be a pretty macro trend that we're seeing out there. Uh, in addition, the drive markets um, and not just the nearby market. I mean, we're talking California and Texas and Florida and New England. I mean, people are, I mean, I've seen probably every single state license plate in our parking lot and in town. Um, people are hopping in their cars and they're going on longer road trips. And so we anticipate that this will likely continue. Uh, I think, you know, air travel is existing, but obviously at a lower level, and I'm sure that will continue to pick up. Um, but as I said before, you know, that desire to escape urban, an urban area and be able to recreate with their family safely, that's definitely something that's happening. Um, additionally, you know, we talked about, you know, I think it was mentioned earlier, is just that longer stay. So guests coming in line to stay longer in the destination uh, within the property management group that we run, Jackson Homes with Lodging, you know, we're also seeing that people are in those properties cooking every single meal in the property, uh, really trying to just kind of nestle in, nestle in with their families and stay longer. And that's been an, an interesting trend that continues to see happening. And then the, you know, the solitary activities, as we've been talking about, you know, with the bike park and what we see within hiking, you know, people are just wanting to get up into nature. And, you know, so for us being able to provide that is working really well. Um, flexi flexible booking policies, you know, people want to understand uh, how flexible we can be to accommodate any possible last minute changes that might be happening with the guest. And then, um, you know, I think just the essence of large gatherings and, you know, what they're looking at. I mean, clearly it's changed our event strategy quite a bit this summer. Typically, we usually do a ton of events and a lot of the events now are more on mountain. So like trail running events and biking events versus actual clustered village events that we would normally do in for base area activation. So these are things that we see, you know, based off of what's going on with the guests some of the key macro things that, um, you know, definitely they're asking us questions about uh, directly and that we see happening on a larger level. 
So you, you mentioned trends and analyzing trends. Are you seeing any trends with your season pass sales right now? Yeah, so um, absolutely. And I think it's, it's interesting that there definitely appears to be a lot of pent up demand. Uh, and I know we've seen that happening with a lot of other resorts. So we had our spring sale running, uh, it kicked off on April 22nd and it ended on June 30th. And kind of when I talk about you know, meeting the guest where they are uh, or the, the pass holder where they are, really trying to accommodate them based off of um, their own individual situation. So I know it was talked about and Katie with the deposit program, we also did that in our spring pass sale. And you know, we decided to run it almost a month longer than we normally do uh, to offer our best pricing. But we did in instill a new deposit program, which allowed for essentially a 60% down and allow the guests to then essentially have that come full term uh, on October 15th and they could cancel for any reason in between that. So really trying to offer as much flexibility as possible, taking advantage of the best pricing, as well as um, adhering to some new past products uh, with new pricing tiers that you know, could accommodate them. And then in addition, um, allowing them from last year to basically have a purchase credit during the spring pass sale towards this season's product. So all in all, it was a super successful sale for us and uh, again, exceeded our expectations and just again, trying to meet the guests where they are knowing that each individual situation is it's their own. And so really trying to accommodate that and it, it worked really well for us. Good, that's great, great positive news. Um, have you put into place anything new for um, pass holders to be considered, you know, more VIP or um, to, you know, to encourage pur purchasing those passes um, and, and maybe getting on mountain first or, you know, it, it, as, as we've got limited capacity with, with the winter. Yeah, with one of the one of the newer products um, in the season pass sale uh, does offer uh, an early up if you book in advance and you are able to adhere to blackout dates. Um, that's something that's offered that was new this year, knowing that obviously that would be of interest. Again, at the highest tier is something that would be driven from special. But really, the biggest thing we did, you know, I think in the past sale was really just try to adhere to. Um, with that past purchaser, just trying to accommodate them as much as we could. And I think that was, that was the ultimate goal. Great. All right. Well, uh, we've reached our time uh, with your one-on-one -on -one as well. So thank you so much. And with that, I'm going to open up our Q&A, invite Rebecca and Katie back uh, to join us. And we have already have a ton of questions. So we're going to hit the ground running. Um, a lot of people have questions that are interested to hear about plans for chairlifts and gondolas and, you know, not being able to pack them full of capacity lines and, and wait time. And so does, does anybody want to tackle that? And does anybody have, uh, you know, plans in, in place for, um, for that? I'll, I'll go first. I can I'll go first. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, we're quite lucky in the fact that we um, have two things that are working in our favor. One is that we have three different access points. So um, that's really beneficial and we don't have gondolas. So we have open chairlifts. Um, again, I, I, things could shift and change, but right now um, we are planning on kind of loading our chairlifts as you would make a reservation in a restaurant. So if you're in your COVID crew and your household wants to ride a lift together, absolutely fine. Um, if you are single, then we have a chair for you alone as well. And then obviously working on that social distancing for the lift line will definitely create a little bit of a different lift maze look. Um, but that's how we're approaching it. Great. Reservations. Got it. Katie? Uh, we're, we're, we have about, uh, well, I have no idea how many portals we have, so it's a little different, but we do have two <laughs> gondolas. And, uh, and, a, and a sky cap, which gets people from one place to another within our village. So we're looking at limiting the number of people that are allowed in there. So family units and known traveling groups can load together. Um, and then if you are single, we'll put two to a gondola with masks. And if you're comfortable with that, if not, we'll, we'll run you single. Uh, as far as lifts, it'll be the same two to a quad. We're trying to see if we can fit three on a six pack right now. Um, to make that happen. And as far as lift lines, we're going to be marking uh, the stanchions on the mazes 
to demonstrate what six feet looks like. Uh, I do know that after opening our bike park this year, even though the bike allows distance between the back tire, the front tire, and the two people, uh, people just jockey up and they get right next to each other. And, and we see that happening in ski lift lines as well. So we're gonna have our lift operators out there making sure that social distancing is occurring uh, and just uh, constant reminders. We've really learned this summer that it takes a lot of reminding and invitation into the conversation um, and it is, it is exhausting. So definitely prepare your employees for that conversation. It, it does add to the daily workload. That makes sense. Um, so another question, I know, Tyler, you have uh, mandatory masks at the resort right now. Are you providing those for guests who don't have them um, or is it, you know, is it bring your own? We do have masks available for every guest if they need one. And obviously the messaging that we have, we encourage guests to bring their own, but we will have them available if they do need one. Um, and we have different locations throughout you know, each of the lift lines where they can, you know, like the bike park, if someone pulls up to the bike parking line and realize they don't have a mask, there's a dispenser right there they can grab and put it on and they're good to go. And do any of you anticipate um, a spike in either uphill skiing, Nordic skiing, cross country skiing, uh, you know, other types of um, activities happening um, that maybe wouldn't have been as popular or also maybe would not be as, as safe or allowed in order to mitigate the gondolas and, and whatnot? Uh, I'll jump in on that one. Uh, at Aspen Snowpass this spring, we actually closed our resorts, but the Forest Service stayed open so people could access our mountains for uphilling, and it became an incredibly popular way to get out. So I have a feeling, and then we do allow it in our winter months as well. We provide up tracks uh, that are marked with signs, and then we have certain times of the day that you can um, be out there during operation. So I do feel that that will be something that will be more heavily trafficked this year based on our spring situation. And then as far as Nordic and other um, things on mountain, I think we'll do everything on mountain. Nordic will do in the valley, down on the valley floor. And I would echo that as well. Um, if anything of the spring reflects what this winter will look like, we saw a really large increase in uh, backcountry users in our area as well as Nordic, I think, again, it's how do you get outside and get exercise? That's what people are going to be looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just say at, at Jackson, we um, unfortunately due to our Forest Service operating permit in summer and winter, we don't allow a full travel um, or say in spring. So, and just given our, our access points are so narrow that you know, clearly keeping our guests safe is priority one. And I think that just ends up being uh, a different experience here in Jackson for, for that. So. Unfortunately, we don't do that, but we do have incredible backcountry skiing. I think with the backcountry skiing, we know that we're going to see probably a bigger insurgence of people going out into you know, our Rock Springs area, our guiding services, um, things like that. I think we anticipate being quite popular. And the backcountry, even just in general in our surrounding area, I know it's already super popular. So we'll see where that goes. We anticipate that being, um, again, something that a lot of people are going to be engaging in. Hmm. Um, so Switching gears a little bit, and I, we, we did touch on, um, you know, staffing and uh, employees, but how do you anticipate the effects of potential absence of J-1 visas uh, impacting your business and staffing and, uh, you know, what, what sort of plans are, are in place in that regard? Okay, I'll go again. <laughs> um, so I, I think that we're again in a little bit of a better situation than some resorts because we do have, um, and I mean, it, it ebbs and flows, but around an average of 70% uh, local employees. Um, that being said, uh, I do think that there is an opportunity for a new pool of employees um, that will exist just because everything has shifted and changes, changed. And I, I feel that a lot of people have had time to reflect on their life and what their life choices are. And, and speaking to some summer operations um, in our area, there's been um, a new intake of employees that they haven't seen before locally. So um, I am a bit of an idealist, but um, I think there will be a new pool available, um, but that's kind of our situation. Very interesting. Yeah, ha not something I considered before, but um, definitely makes sense. Anybody else wanna to touch on that or moving on to the next question? 
famous thing for, for Jackson, I mean, obviously, you know, we, we have historically brought in J1s to help to run out our, obviously, staffing base. So we'll for sure be targeting the local market uh, much more aggressively. We do have employee housing as well. So I think that's something that's of interest to be able to accommodate uh, more folks. And again, the influx of people wanting to be in the mountains and get out of their urban areas uh, sounds like a great opportunity to come and, and operate and work at Jackson in the winter. Yeah. Uh, ditto for Aspen Snowmass coupling uh, or following Jackson's model. Great. So um, I know a couple of you had tuned into uh, our DMO focus webinar and um, they talked a little bit there about utilizing meeting space for indoor dining in order to um, you know, socially distance people. What, what plans does everybody have for indoor dining that you know, obviously is very different from tackling the outdoor dining that, that's happening now? Um, I'll step in. Uh, <clears throat> That's a great conversation that we're uh, entering right now. We have two restaurants open that are not hotel based. We have also have restaurants within the hotels that we run and operate. So on mountain, we're looking at technology and ways that we can serve the guest um, where there's less interaction and less touch. Uh, we're looking at touchless pay systems. As far as space, we are considering how we on mountain look at tenting certain areas so that we can expand the indoor space, if you will, um, because of the social distancing while still allowing for that outdoor deck space to exist. So we're looking at flat spots on the mountain, close to restaurants, as well as a satellite areas that people can grab and go and buy something at a restaurant and go eat at this other location where there's a tent or a yurt. Um, Again, just starting that conversation to really look at how we expand indoor spacing as well. Rebecca, I saw you nodding your head a lot. Is there anything, yeah. you, anything you want to add there? Or? No, we're, we're on the same page um, over at Whitewater. Exactly like I talked about, how do we expand our outdoor spaces? How do we do more grab and go? Um, definitely for our, our seated dining, we're exploring going reservation only um, just to avoid um, queuing. Um, it's a very popular destination, our bar weird. Um, so how do we make sure that people when they come, they don't have to worry about queuing to get a seat. Um, so yeah, how do we make it easier and slower? Um, we have one access point that we're exploring, maybe a ski through kind of like a um, opportunity to grab and go um, that way as well. So we're definitely on the same page, but just trying to figure it out. Great. And so this question um, is actually not something that we've, we've really touched upon or talked about before but how do you see uh, retail operations being affected within the resort? And I can talk for us and we've seen um, you know, incredible retail so far this summer. It's been a big bright spot for us. And I think that's where, you know, you think about trying to go cashless payments, you're thinking about flexi screens that are protecting employee to guest. Uh, we're thinking about, you know, touchless bike rental, which we're already doing. Uh, you can reserve and essentially get them set up on their bikes, have the bike ready for them so they can just walk up, um, drop it off when they come back, we disinfect and turn that around. So that whole process, you know, from retail and rental is, um, you know, we've learned a lot within summer, but I think just trying to encourage, I'd say, as, as much touchless interaction as possible, I think that's been a, a key focus area for us. It's been working thus far. Yeah, and similar to Jackson, to Tyler, we, we've been experiencing that with bike rentals as well, figuring out those touchless pieces. For winter, we're looking into reservation systems, getting a time available that you can come pick up your skis or snowboard. Um, we're, we're putting all the safety measures in place. I think our biggest challenge right now is boot fitting, to be quite honest, because there's so much close interaction with that. So we're looking at figuring out, we're trying to find ways to figure out how a guest can fit themselves, given the option of different boots and, and the guidance from people in the store. Um, and then really looking at one-way traffic is so important with that flow, is can you get them in one door and out the other so there, there isn't that crisscross interaction. Um, and that's been, it, it, whatever you need to do to make that happen, see if it's possible. <laughs> it's, it's been a big help. Yeah, and one thing that we're exploring is how do we um, kind of that greeter approach. 
um, for our ski or services building, which hosts our snow school and rentals, um, which is a bit separate than retail. But how do you have someone that greets them outside to try and mitigate the people that enter that don't necessarily need to be there? Um, just trying to, again, give people to direction to navigate the kind of new operation that we'll be working with them. Hmm. Great. So we're almost at time. So I want to end uh, hearing from each of you with one last question. And what do you think has um, been the biggest opportunity that's that's come out of this pandemic situation or the, um, you know, the, the biggest bright spot that, that you've seen in, in the way uh, that, that you're, you know, running your resorts? And uh, Rebecca, we'll start with you. Okay, well, Katie and I were actually talking about this um, prior to, but I think this is a really big opportunity to change things at your resort that you um, maybe didn't have the capacity to, or you just got consistent in, here's what we've done, let's improve that. Um, everything has shifted and changed. So I think we're looking at it when we go through our strategic planning and our operations, like what is our ideal instead of what are the challenges we need to overcome and how do we get to our ideal? Um, what are things that we've wanted to do in the past, but just haven't had the capacity or we're just concerned how it would impact what we've been doing before, but everything's going to be different. So we're really taking that opportunity to try and make some changes that maybe we should have done before and just haven't had the opportunity. Katie. Um, I think the biggest bright spot for me is that the planning process is a mind bender and it's scary, but once you open, you can make the adjustments you need to, and, and it's all doable. Um, I think you do have to go in with the attitude that there are no sacred cows. You can't um, hold on to something because it's always been that way. You really have to, as Rebecca mentioned, be flexible and adjustable. So I would just say the, the biggest thing for us is we found out we can do it. And it's scary thinking about winter because of volume and how we're going to try and control that. But there are ways and it will work. And, and when it doesn't, you'll know how to have the conversation to make that adjustment, is, is my opinion. Yep. And Tyler. Yeah, I would say probably one of the, the biggest bright spots is just um, our internal team, you know, in terms of trying to adapt and adjust and plan. I think we've all come so much more closer together and we're far more tighter uh, because of that, as we're all, you know, working to try to solve a similar problem in different kinds of ways. And I think that's been, been huge. And even since, you know, one closure, which was obviously uh, incredible opportunity for learnings, and then all of the planning for summer and all of the things we're thinking about for winter and all the fluidity that's mixed in with that and all of the people that are touching and engaging and running this operation, uh, we've all learned so much and there's still so much more to learn. And I think that's been just a, a phenomenal aspect from leadership all the way down to frontline employees um, it's been, it's been exceptional. Great. Well, yeah, there definitely are lots of different, different bright spots with this situation and, and lots of learnings that have come from it. So, well, we are at time. I thank you so much, all three of you for joining us. This has been a very valuable conversation for our audience. I apologize. We've had tons of questions and, and weren't able to get to quite all of them. So uh, appreciate everyone for being on the line and listening and uh, picking the brains of our uh, speakers today. So uh, thanks so much, guys. And uh, uh, enjoy having enjoy Thank you very much, Kat. Yeah, thanks for yeah. having us. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Take care, everybody. Bye.